Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. A very familiar verse of Scripture. And I believe it's something that we often hear referred to. Um, at least me personally, I often hear people refer to this verse when they're faced with something difficult. Um, they're faced with a challenge. They're faced with um, something that has come into their life that um, they're not sure how they can get around or how they can get through or how the Lord's even going to work it out. And you often hear people claim this verse in those times, and I'm not saying that's wrong by no means. Absolutely that's true. Um, but I believe it goes beyond that. In Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 13, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Our great heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for this day. Lord, we're so thankful for the blessing we have to come into your house tonight, Lord. Lord, I'm thankful just for the call to preach. Lord, I'm just so grateful and thankful for the uh, just the ability to stand behind your pulpit, Lord. I thank you for a pastor that uh, has confidence in, in not just myself, Lord, but the other wonderful preachers we have here in the church when he's away. Uh, Lord, to be willing to use any of us, Lord, to be able to stand and preach your word. Lord, I just ask you to just help me tonight be with what you've laid upon my heart. Lord, help me convey it here to your people the way you gave it to me. Lord, help it be a blessing to each and every one of us, Lord, that if there be any here tonight that's lost, Lord, help them see their need for salvation and get saved. Lord, but each and every one of us walk out of here tonight closer to you than what we was and we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want to look at by way of introduction is we see that first letter, uh, the first word, as you would say, here in this verse, and the subject that it's dealing with is just I. Now, I, I truly, honestly b believe, that as I believe everybody here tonight does, uh, that the Word of God was given by the inspiration of God. It was given to men to pin down. And so we have Paul here writing to the church of Philippi. I believe, Brother Donald, that if this verse was only meant for Paul, it would have said, I, Paul, can do all things. But that's not what it says. It says, I. So that means when you're reading that verse, you might as well put yourself in there. I, Brother Phil. I, Sister Lisa, I, Brother Josh, can do all things. So as we get into looking at the, the message tonight that we'll look at in, in a little bit, keep in mind that that subject this first deals with is each and every one of us individually. Each and every one of us can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So we see the subject, but I see the surety in the next two words, can do. You know, we've often heard, too, our pastor talk about having run one rule around here, mind God. And I remember a few years ago, he come up saying that he added on the second rule, don't use the word can't. Because too many times that just becomes an excuse. Well, I just can't do that. Well, I just can't do Because that's the easy way out, Brother Phil. It's easy a way out is just to say, well, I can't do that. Well, why can't you? Well, I just can't. Well, why not? Well, I just can't. Because that's the attitude too many times we have. But the Bible tells us right here, I can do. It tells me I can do all things. I can do whatever it is that God would have me to do. And we see the source on why I can do all things through Christ. What he just saying, I can. He walks with me. He talks with me. He is the source of everything that I do. He should be the source of everything that we do. We should get up in the morning and pray and ask God for guidance throughout the day. You know, we, I'm afraid too many times we get into just the uh, normal routine of our day-to-day -day life and we get up and we just go through the day and, and we, we go to work and we think, well, I, you know, I see the same people at work. Yeah, I was talking to Ms., uh, Sister Tina yesterday and I said, it's weird. I said, I work in a building that, I don't know how many square feet it is. I'm not good at guessing that kind of stuff. It might be 25 by 100. I don't know. And there's 10 or 12 of us that work in there and there's, some, there's a few people in there I won't talk to for three days, Brother Phil. We just we we work different departments. We don't. Josh knows what it's like. You have people you walk you won't talk to for a week sometimes in, in those buildings. And but we just get to going through the normal routine. I'm afraid day to day, and we fail to seek God for to be our source of everything. Uh, first thing in the morning, and this verse tells us not only our subject, the surety, the source, but where we get our strength from. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. When you think you can't, God says we can. When we think that we just have nothing else that we can do, look for God for our strength. 
Look to Christ to strengthen us. Look to Him to walk with us, to talk with us. Look for Him to provide the correct answer that Sister Caitlin talked about. Look for Him just to walk in the garden with us, so to speak, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I want to do something a little bit different here. I, I, I don't know that we've ever done this. I, I'm sure probably somebody has throughout time. I just forget time to time. But we're going to read this, and I want us all to read it together. Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. Let's all begin. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It means each and every one of us can do what God would have us to do. So what I want to preach on with God's help this morning, or this evening, that ain't this morning, is it? So when are you going to start? So when are we going to start? You know, I, I talked to, to Brother Doug on, on Sunday uh, evening, Sunday afternoon, right before the evening service, and I said, Friday was a day, and if you read the devotion on Monday, I even touched on it in the devotion on Monday, I said, Friday was a day to be celebrated. Friday was a day that it was a wonderful thing that happened in the fact of what came down from the Supreme Court. But things are just getting started. And all you had to do to see that was see what went on in Cincinnati, whatever it was, yesterday or day before, whenever that mayor came out and said that they're going to pay for city employees to go wherever you need to go in order to be able to get an abortion if a lady wants to. Now, I'm not going to get on all the political stuff and everything of all that, but that shows the importance of voting even on uh, just a local level. That, the importance of everything that we do. So when are we going to start? Well, this world is not in the condition that it's in today by accident. This world, is, I'm afraid, is in the condition it is today because too many times as Christians, we have failed to do what we should do. We have failed to do what we need to do. So the first question I have is, when are we going to start? When are we going to start being a driver of the gospel? Matthew chapter number 28 tells us, go into all your nations, teaching them telling them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We see that take place in Matthew chapter 28. We see that commission told what we're to do. What are we doing? What are you doing to get the gospel out? If I had my phone, I would take it, but I, I put it over there because I don't like having it in my pocket. Uh, we have all, everything that we have at our fingertips. We have phones, and we all have, uh, a majority of people have some sort of social media. What most people have some sort of way, and you probably have uh, hundreds upon hundreds of, uh, of names and things like that in your phone. What are you doing to get the gospel out? When was the last time, or have you ever just picked a random person out, sent them a verse, just tell them you're praying for them? Even if they are lost. Even if they might not want anything. We have so many ways to get the gospel out nowadays. It's not just about coming and going on visitation on Monday nights. It's not about just about doing that. We all have the ability to be able to share the gospel with somebody on a daily basis, do we? Do we? It might be social media. You know, it might be... Uh, um, um, getting on and posting a, a, a verse or, or, or posting a video or posting something uh, for other people to see the gospel. But we, we are way more opportunity now than what they did even 15 years ago. And I heard somebody, I was listening to a podcast on uh, Monday, and the lady, it was uh, a lady on this, uh, it was a hunting podcast, and the lady's promoting some hearing devices and things to um, help keep you from, you know, when you're shooting guns and all that kind of stuff, help uh, um, muffle the sound, so to speak. And she was talking about, she sang the national anthem as how her and her husband met at a basketball game, and she said, this is how long ago this was, and she said, I had an iPod shuffle. This was even just back in 2007 or 6 or 7, just 15 years ago. We didn't have phones the way we do now. So in 15 years, God has allowed the technology for us to have many computers carried around in our pocket. In 15 years, God has allowed for us to be able to be in uh, contact with people all across this country. What are we doing to get the gospel out? When was the last person you shared anything about the gospel? Not just about uh, telling them, hey, I went to church last night, you know, try to make ourselves feel better, whatever me. But I mean, truly told somebody and asked them, are you saved? Are you born again? Have you been to church? Not just are you going to church, are you, are you going to church? Do you know without a doubt that you're saved and you spend eternity in heaven? Because you're still hard-pressed to find anybody that wouldn't tell you that they was a Christian. But I would find hard-pressed to find people that are truly born again and saved when you look at the way some people live. 
when are we going to begin to be a driver of the gospel? You know, we have our pastor, I've just, he has said multiple times, we go out on Monday nights. If there's a different time that you need to go, you let us know and we will find a group to go with you. We're trying to start a bus ministry. We're going to start going out on Saturday mornings here pretty soon and be able to go out. If you can't go on Monday nights, maybe you can go on Saturday mornings. Come let us know. We'll need more people to go out. What are you doing to drive the gospel? Secondly, what are you doing to be decisive? She sang about it, and I didn't know what song she was going to sing. I didn't know what she, uh, anything like that. But in Daniel chapter number 3, verses 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer, th answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They were decisive in what they were going to do, Brother Phil. We are not going to serve this golden image you've set up. We are not going to do that. You go over about two or three chapters later and you find Daniel. It talks about he knew the decree was signed, yet he opened his windows and knelt in prayer as he had done aforetime. As he had done time after time after time, he was not going to let some decree and the threat of being thrown into lions then prevent him from being decisive in his service for the Lord. When are we going to start being decisive? Because too many times all it takes is the smallest little thing to keep us out of church, so to speak. All it takes is the smallest little thing all of a sudden and we'll uh, lay out on a Wednesday night. I was talking to Brother Clint before service and said it's very easy and the time we live in today is you miss a Wednesday night, you miss a Sunday night and all of a sudden then it's easier to miss the next time and before you know it, you're not even there. And it's not even just about church, anything. We got a three day weekend coming up. I do not, I already don't want to go back to work next Tuesday. Already. I already don't want to have to go back to work next Tuesday. And it's supposed to be a nice, beautiful weekend. You know, I have Tina works all weekend for the most part. It's just me and Bella most of the weekend. It's going to be wonderful. Not that there's anything against Caitlin or Tina. Just I'm just saying. But I already don't want to. And it's so easy to get away from things. When are we going to start being decisive about this is what I am going to do? I'm going to study my Bible. Lord, you can do whatever you want to do, or devil, you can do whatever you want to do to distract me. I'm studying the Word of God today. I'm not going to hit the snooze on that alarm. I'm going to get up early and read my Bible before I go to work. I'm going to go to church. You can set up whatever family reunion you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do, but I am going to church. Because too many times we're too wishy-washy, and it gets us into trouble. We'll have somebody ask us a question. You even just use what's in the news right now. People, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, the Bible still says it's wrong. Uh, you, you can come up with whatever excuse you want. The Bible still says it's wrong. The Bible still gives us some things that we need to stand on. The Bible still gives us some things that we need to be decisive on. No, God says it. That settles it. You know, you, you've heard it talked about, I think, Brother Doug, and I've heard other uh, preachers talk about a bumper sticker or whatever. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't care if you believe it or not. God said it, that settles it. And we need to be decisive on some things. We need to start standing up for the truth. We need to start doing what the Bible says is right and just tell people, look, this is the way it is. This is you need to be in church. You need to be safe. You need to be doing this or whatever it may be. You look at the disciples. You know, too many times I believe... We are uh, uh, too um, passive about what we want to do. If God tells us to do something, we need to do it. Think of the disciples as Jesus comes by some of them and he says, I'll make you fishers of men. Just drop everything to do them, Brother Jim. Just go follow him. Right. When was the last time we dropped everything we was doing and even just got down to pray? Yeah. Just got down to, you know what? I just feel a need. I'm just going to read my Bible. I know I'm in the middle of whatever it may be, but I'm just going to go read the Word of God. When are we going to start being decisive in the things of God? When are we going to start developing? 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We just had in 2020 a year that I would say most of us in this building, if not all of us in this building, probably worked less that year than you ever have because of things that went on with the pandemic. How much closer to God did you get during that time? How much closer to God are you now than you was even a week ago? How much closer to, and you know, I get, this just popped into my mind, so I'm going to say it. 
You know, sometimes we may think, oh, well, hey, I read the Bible, and, you know, I just know so much, and, you know, I've had nothing to go on. Will we not tell, will you not tell Miss Crystal that you love her more today than you did yesterday? Why are we not the same thing with God? Why do we not love him more today than we did yesterday? Why do we not try to learn more about him today than we did yesterday? I would be willing to bet none of us in here know this entire book. So therefore, we need to spend more time in it. When was the last, what are we doing to develop ourselves? It's not our pastor's job to stand up here and spiritually feed us every time. That is not what we should be basing our Christian life on. It should not be our pastor's job to come in here and try to see us grow spiritually service after service. That should be our job. Now I'm going to ask you, I had everybody read that verse so everybody could say the word I and understand it was you. It's going to require now a little bit more work on your part tonight. You know, keep, make sure to keep you awake. You don't fall asleep on me. If you're in here tonight and you've been saved less than five years, I want you to raise your hand. So some, some have raised hands, some a little bit shy, but there's multiple hands gone up. When have any of us that, have, uh, that are in here, what have we done to help those people develop as young Christians? When was the last time we reached out to anybody and said, hey, you know, I, I know you recently got saved, Brother Donald. Is there anything you don't understand? Anything you got questions about? By all means, it go, I, I'm not I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. By all means... We should go to the pastor. But sometimes the pastor's busy. Sometimes the pastor, if he had to answer every single one of our questions, it would become overwhelming, Brother Jim. But when was the last time we just went out with somebody? Hey, you know, I know you just got saved. and Anything you've, just, you've been studying, anything you want to know about, maybe I can help you. I told the fellows back there when I started the men's meeting on the Thursday night, but by no means, but by, I, I told them, I said, I am probably the dumbest person sitting here in this room. I said, so you have something that you know about, you've studied, and you, you're well-versed on, you want to teach? By all means, teach. Because I do not know it all, by no stretch. I said, if there's anything you want to learn, you tell me. We'll all try to study and learn together. But when was the last time we tried to help anyone else develop as a Christian? The Bible tells us, as I read, it talked about Matthew chapter number 28. Oh, I'm going to go back and read it just so that I don't misquote it. But it talks about, we, we use it so much for salvation, and absolutely we should. But it tells us about, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even until the end of the world. Amen. How much teaching do we even try to do to young Christians? I understand you might not be the pastor, you might not be the Sunday school teacher, but why does that mean we can't help others develop? Why does that mean we can't help others? How, it might just be them watching our life. Just if, if somebody, if you took whoever the newest Christian was in this building, what have they learned from watching your life? How can, have they, are they able to develop as a Christian just by watching your life? By watching your faithfulness? By watching how much you participate? By watching how much you worship? Because I can tell you that I'm not trying to be mean if you're sitting here today. I, I promise I'm not trying to be mean. But if somebody in here is saved or somebody comes in here that's a visitor and they see you walk in here and plop down, amen, wonderful, and they never see you smile, why would they come back? Why would they want what you have? Why would they have any care about the things for Christ if that's what they see? Because we are always being looked at. We are always being watched. What are, when are we going to start not only developing ourselves but starting to help develop others? The fourth thing, when are we going to start dealing with the truth? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, if Tina's watching at work, she's probably mad because I've taken way too many drinks. I'm too nervous. So that's the way I slow down. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And you know something else, one of those words that comes up next? Profitable for doctrine and for correction. How much are we dealing with the truth when we look in the mirror? We have no problem turning the camera around, taking a pretty selfie of ourselves and posting or whatever, but how often do we take that camera and look at ourselves when it comes to the Bible? God, show me what I need to do to be better. God, show me from your word what I need to work on to be a better Christian. God, show me what I can do to help somebody else. God, show me where I need to be in my Christian walk and where I fall short. 
How much are we willing to deal with the truth that it looks back at us when we look in the mirror? That can be a tough thing to do because we all, I'm afraid, think too highly of ourselves from time to time because it becomes very easy to come to church on a Wednesday night and look around and see who's not here and say, well, so-and-so wasn't there. I'm better off than they are because I was, I was at every service this week and I haven't seen so-and-so in three weeks. What's that got to do with anything? It has nothing to do with my spirituality. But when are we willing to start, when are we going to begin to deal with the truth on what's looking back at us in the mirror? When are we going to start dealing with the truth of what's going on in the world? And we'll get into that even a little bit later on. But I'm afraid too many times we walk around with our head in the sand of what's going on. If we would wake up and realize the Bible talks about, and we hear it all the time talked about, in the end time, perilous times shall come. And we talk about, oh, that those times are here, and you can look at everything going on. Why do we not take it more serious? If I was to ask now, who out here knows lost loved ones? Who has lost co-workers? Who has lost family? It wouldn't just be a few of us raise our hand. Each and every one of us would be raising our hand. Why then are we not taking it more serious, the fact that Jesus could come back the next instant? And if they're not saved, they're going to spend eternity in hell. They're going to spend eternity with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why do we not take and deal with that truth that's out in the world to look at things and say, things aren't going to get better? I truly believe with all my heart God could still send revival. We could, we could see revival break out here even tonight. I believe with all my heart God could still send revival. We could still see people saved, and I believe that because if it wasn't the case, God would have already called us all home. We would have been with him tonight in glory. But the fact that we're still here means God's not done. But that don't mean that our world, that our country is going to get any better. That don't mean that things are just going to all of a sudden be uh, 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 rainbows and roses or whatever you want to say starting tomorrow. This world is still slipping out and we still know things could get worse. So when are we going to start dealing with that truth and saying, I need to make sure I'm inviting my family. I'm inviting my coworkers. I'm sharing the gospel with them. I'm doing whatever I can to help open up and make them see they need to be saved before it's too late. They need to realize of what's going on in this world and the truth that's going on. That means each and every day we are closer and closer to Jesus Christ's return. When are we going to start dealing with that truth? The fifth thing, I made this comment on Monday night, talking with Brother Ray and then before we went out on a visitation out here. When are we going to start dreaming big? And when it comes to the things of God. I have noticed that if we have big dreams on something we want, Brother Josh, we will work in order to, to fulfill those things. We will do things, if we have big dreams for our kids, we will work overtime or we'll do extra to be able to be our, sure our kids have the best things that they can. We, uh, we'll do whatever we can. What about the things of God? How big can we dream? Brother Ray was talking. We was out here talking Monday night. And he was talking about, I don't remember now, the subject that came up. And he was talking about uh, uh, building that and what we was going to do and, and moving people or whatever. I still believe that if it's God will, God can give us the rest of this street. We could still build the rest of this building and it could be used for something else. When are we going to start build, dreaming big when it comes to the things of God? That I believe God could send a revival like we only read about. Do we ever dream that? Do we ever, do you ever truly get up and come to church on Sunday morning saying, God, I would just like to see you just show up this morning and see you save 15 people over to jail and come into church and just save 10 people and pastor preach for an hour and a half, Brother Phil, and we just get behind him and see true revival break out that we've never seen before. Does anybody ever have that thought? Is it just me? Is it just two or three of us? When was the last time you truly came to church just fully expecting God to do something. I've, I've heard Brother Doug say this multiple times, and they talk about when him growing up, and if somebody didn't get saved, you'd see the altar just filled with people asking God, God, is it me? When was the last time we just came and said, God, is it me? Search me, let me look in the mirror, and make sure there's nothing in my life that needs cleaned up, or needs cleaned out, or needs got right, for God to send revival. I would love to see it. I, it's, you know, I, would, just, I would love that. I've, I told you all about that book that I have that I read about great men who've seen revival even back in the early 1900s. I would love to see something like that break out here. I would love to see us just fall in love with God to see him show up so big uh, that the bars and things did have to close on Sunday because nobody was at him. I believe God can do that. I believe with all my heart he can do that. 
You know, somebody at work was talking, and, and I didn't realize it was, was the, uh, for some of you that go to, I didn't realize, Sister Dawn, that it's actually, I think I found out yesterday, it's the third Sunday, I think, or third weekend of every month, they do that stupid antique show over there in Burlington. And I've shared this before, one of the first times I come out of jail, and I say, I'm like, are you kidding? You have the truth going out at multiple churches in the area. I believe everybody should come to ours, but you have the truth being preached at multiple churches in the area, and people would rather go buy junk on a Sunday morning than come to church. Why? Because we've not started doing what we need to do. Because they don't see the realness coming out to know that time is running away. Time is fleeting for us to be able to reach a lost and dying world. And we need to get started dreaming that God, God could send all those people in. What if, it, you know, the next month or whatever, I guess the third week, I guess it'd be in July. What happens if they have to shut that down in July because everybody's in church? God can do that. But I'm afraid we, we just have no desire. See, in order for us to have the, if we dream it, we will do whatever we can to see it happen. We do that in our normal everyday lives. If I want something, I'm going to work in order to get it. I'm going to uh, uh, work extra, whatever it may be, or whatever we have to do in order to be able to get it. But when it comes to things of God, I think we just sit back and say, well, if God wants to do it, he will. Really? He can. He can do it that way. But why would he send revival? Why would he do those things if we truly don't want it? If we can't see it, if we don't truly dream of what God can do, why would he do it? Sometimes he would do it in spite of us, but why do we just always expect that to be the case? The last thing, when are you going to get started? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That means we can do anything through God. If it being God's will, we can do anything through Christ which strengtheneth us. When are we going to decide, when are we going to begin to defy logic? Logic says to stay comfortable. Logic tells me that I am in the best church in the country. Logic tells me I serve and I, I get to serve under the best pastor in the country. Logic tells me, Brother Phil, I got the best church members in the country. So all I need to do is make sure I'm at every service that I can. I can go out on visitation on Monday nights, do a little this, do a little that, and just stay right here where I'm comfortable. And if God wants me to, and if God wants you to, by all means, do that. I, I don't want to see us lose anybody. I don't want to see anybody go anywhere. But that's what logic tells us. What does God tell you to do? What is God telling you to do? Logic tell us, tells us to stay quiet, and we won't ruffle any feathers. Too many Christians are willing to just walk around and keep our mouth shut so we don't ruffle feathers. Too many Christians are willing to just sit around and let whatever happens, happens so that we don't upset anybody, so that we don't push anybody's wrong buttons, so to speak. Because logic tells us that logic tells us that's a smart thing to do. When are we going to start being willing to stand up and say, no, this is what the Bible says. This is what I'm going to stand up for. This is what I'm going to stand upon. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry. I'm going to pray for you that you get right, you get born again, and you'll see the same thing that I see. Logic tells us too many times to stay quiet and we won't ruffle any feathers. Logic tells us that if we just stay here and sit still, we won't have any regrets. Because, see, if the Bible, if we say, well, God's told me to go do this or go do that, and we get there and we have any hardships, and we begin to think, well, I should have just stayed where I was. No, the Bible doesn't tell us that we're not going to face hardships. It doesn't tell us that you might not go, uh, might not call you to be a missionary and you'll be facing something out there that you never dreamed you would face. When are we going to start defying logic and just do something that God has us to do instead of being comfortable? The easy thing to do is to walk in the doors three times a week, sit down, amen our pastor, amen our preacher, uh, get moved by some of the singing, get moved by the preaching, and get up and walk out and go home and never do nothing for God. That's what logic tells us is the easy thing to do. When are we going to start doing something a little more? I'll just, I'm not, I don't mean to embarrass them. To, to me, this is just me speaking. Defying logic is getting in a bus at 5 a.m. and driving however long it took Brother Peter to drive with 13 young people. Defying logic is getting on the bus. What time are you all leaving when you leave? They don't know yet. Whenever they get in the bus here in two weeks and leave and drive however many hours it is with a bunch of teenagers. That's the fine logic. That's it, because it doesn't make sense to do that kind of thing. Have, do, do you, all of you in here have teenagers? Do you want to spend a week like that? Do you want to spend eight or nine hours with them sitting in a car like that? I have no desire to do that anymore. Defying logic. 
When are we going to start doing things that's out of the ordinary? Logic tells me to do this, but what does God tell me to do? What is, what, what is God speaking to me about to do in my life? I'm not telling you that it means you might have to be a missionary, or God not, might be calling you to be a preacher, or whatever it may be, but God has something he wants each and every one of us to do. When are we going to begin defying logic and stop sitting on our hands and stop being comfortable and do something that God wants us to do? I was standing at work today in the back in our shipping area, and there's a calendar up there. Now, notice on that calendar, it tells the number of days that we've had this year and the number of days that are left. This Friday, July 1st, is day 182, which means there's 183 days left. So if I've got it figured up in my goofy brain correctly, Brother Donald, that means at about noon Friday, that's the midpoint of the year. So that means we will have had six months past and we'll have six months ahead of us. So if you go from, even just start now, let's start tonight, but let's just say for use our imagination. So you start Friday at noon and you get New Year's Eve at midnight and you kiss your significant other to ring in the new year. Are you going to have six months of regret to look back on? or six months of progress to look back on. Because too many times, the easy thing to do and the logical thing to do is to stay exactly where we're at, and I'm afraid we get to that six months, and we're going to look back, and if we're honest with ourselves, if we begin to look ourselves and define ourselves looking in the mirror truthfully, we have six months of regrets. Because we can look back and say, am I truly closer to God now than what I was on July 1st at noon? Have I really done something else in my life to make a difference in anybody else's? Have I truly done what God wants me to do in my life the last six months? Have I truly moved forward with God? When are you going to start? Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. What is the all things he wants you to do? And when are you going to start? Brother Clint, you come and get your guitar, start playing something. I'll invite all everybody to stand. When the altar is open, what is it God wants you to do? What are you not doing or what is it you could do if you would just answer him? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for this day. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that you're the one that gives us the strength. Lord, we're thankful that you're the one that walks with us and talks with us, Lord. We're thankful, Lord, that if we would just lean on you, Lord, of everything that you could do with us and through us, not only individually, but even as a church, Lord. We just ask you to just deal with hearts during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.